Please, have you seen Why are you alone, woman? My son. He's only 12. He's... Her kids are nowhere. It's Jerusa. You from here? No. We came for the Passover feast. We thought he was in the caravan. The feast was three days ago. Jesus! Jesus! Mary. <gasps> Ima? everywhere, day and night. We were so scared. I told him. He's okay. Why is everyone so upset? Mary, he was in there. She was supposed to be riding in the caravan with Uncle Abaita. I was supposed to be with my father. Then why weren't you? I was. <sighs> you were in the temple? It was incredible, Mary. You should have seen him. He was teaching when I found him. The rabbis, the scribes, the scholars, they could not believe their ears. They barely let us be. Didn't you know I must be in my father's house? It is too early for all this. If not now, when? Just help us get through all of this with you. Please. Maybe we should get going before they make a formal inquiry. Hmm? Jesus, please don't do that again. Huh? Yes, Abba. May I read? We'll see. Hmm? Come now. We've got a long journey. What are you going to do for your mother for this insurance version, huh? I'm going to make him rub your feet. Abba. <laughs> so, hey, everybody. Welcome to Embrace the Question. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to take a look at episode five called The Wedding Gift. And this is, if it's possible yet another one of my favorite episodes because there's just so much Jewish culture, heritage, detail packed into this episode. <clears throat> and incidentally, well, uh, it's July 5th, so I'm wearing my patriotic clothing. Happy Independence Day to everyone. We just watched the intro, which is Jesus when he's 12 getting lost in Jerusalem. His parents find him in the temple. We have the we have the first appearance of Joseph here, and I I don't think I noticed this the the first time I saw this episode. So this was like watching it for the first time for me. I don't remember this little this little clip. This this was the first appearance of Joseph, and we know that he hasn't made another appearance since. It's assumed that Joseph dies. And why do we assume that Joseph dies? Because for this main reason, Jesus is a carpenter. And had Joseph not died, Joseph would still be the carpenter of the family. And Jesus being uh, more into scholarly pursuits never would have plied the trade of carpenter, carpenter or <clears throat> tecton he could have actually been a stonemason. The scripture says he was a tecton, so he shaped either wood or stone. And there were a lot of stone quarries in Jerusalem. He could have been a shaper of stone, which he has called you and I standing stones. That would make really good sense to me. But everyone has gone with the carpentry theme. I, I accept that. Joseph here probably got sick and died, and Jesus had to take up the family trade because he was the eldest. So that's why we all assume that Joseph died, okay? We also find Jesus teaching in the temple. He, the scripture says he's teaching and asking questions. What we a lot of times miss in our culture is that when you are a student of Torah in that day, the further up you advance, which 
becomes more and more elite. The more fewer and fewer go further and further. So Jesus was really pushing things scholastically. He was very good with Torah, as you might imagine. And he was at that stage of his education where in the rabbinic, asking questions was more important than anything else. And it wasn't a means of obtaining information. It was a means of implying knowledge. So you asked questions in order to converse. The minute you didn't ask a question, your conversation was over. Here's, here's an example. The Pharisees come up to Jesus and say, where did you get the authority to do this? And they ask a question. Jesus always responded with a question. So he would say, well, where did John get his authority, meaning John the Baptist? And at this point, the Pharisees have a choice to make. They can say, well, we don't know, which isn't a question. Or they can say, I, we don't know where did John get his authority, in which case the conversation continues because they ended their part with a question. In the instance I'm telling you about, the Pharisees responded with, we don't know where John got his authority. To which Jesus, basically in a very rabbinic way, says, then I have nothing to say to you. Because at that point, the Pharisees should have said, well, John the Baptist got his authority from, from God. In which case, Jesus would have also ended the conversation by saying, well, then why didn't you believe John the Baptist when he said, I am the Messiah? The Pharisees didn't want to steer the conversation in that direction, so they ended it. All that to say is, when we read scripture, we see Jesus asking a lot of questions in order to force an answer from the people that, have trying, that are trying to trap him. And when Jesus is doing that, he's doing it as a master rabbi. He is a master at questions and answers. So when we see him at 12 in the temple, teaching and asking questions, he's asking questions not because he doesn't know, although he's still at a learning stage, but he is asking questions because that's what he's supposed to do. He's asking questions so they can return the conversation with a question and questions lead to questions lead to questions and they can converse in that in that regard the minute someone makes a statement and not a question the conversation is over and it is in some situations considered a complete lack of skill to not ask a question so we find jesus at 12 completely skilled in the rabbinic order already teaching and asking questions. Pretty awesome. I loved the fact that we get a glimpse into what it might have been like for Mary and Joseph at this time when they're looking for Jesus, right? You lost the Son of God? That would have been... <laughs> yeah, that would have been hard to take. She's sitting there wondering, okay, I am the, I am Mary. I am supposed to be the steward over this person that is going to save the world. And I have lost him. I have lost him at a time when there are over half a million people in, in Jerusalem. You, it, it would have been very difficult to live through that. But anyway, thanks for watching this video with me. Let's see what else comes up. Miracles. Yes, John. Signs and wonders. From who? You. <laughs> Are you adding those to my list of infractions? Only a fantasy. You would have labeled Moses a lunatic for talking to a shrub. Do you consider yourself to be like Moses? Tell me about your ministry. 
Do you remember when Caesar traveled through Judea? Yes. He sent all these men to clear logs and debris for the coming king. Make straight the way for the king, they'd shout. Prepare the way. The roads in Jerusalem do not have the same problem, but I remember the visit. I had to move. Romans aren't kind to the homeless, lost all my possessions. Many in Jerusalem were frightened as well. Oh, they were lucky to have you to comfort them. For a price, of course. Should we be clearing the road for you, John? Is that the point of this story? I don't like your frock. The cost of the vestments alone could feed three children in Nazareth for a month. Do you hail from Nazareth? Hmm? And Jericho, and Bethlehem, Jaffa, Hebron. I see. Well, you have a new home now. Whatever your mission was, I hope you completed it. I thought you were here to ask about miracles. But first, I wanted to tell you of a miracle that I've seen, but cannot comprehend. And then to make accusations. This is pointless. Clearly, you are not a frothing madman, but every bit as unreasonable. You imprison me and accuse me of being ill-tempered? I am it. not your captor. Do you not understand? This is a Roman cell. I came here to speak to the warden on your behalf. On my behalf? <laughs> Why are you really here, old man? The official reason? You are a Jewish citizen. If you have broken Jewish law, it sets a dangerous precedent to allow Rome to adjudicate. Uh, <laughs> and the real reason? The truth? I am far from home. I am looking in places I would never go because I am searching for an explanation for something I... I cannot unsee. No one else knows you're here. Tell me from the beginning. Okay. Do you know how heavy that is? That is just so awesome. Of course, if you've seen any of these commentaries, then you know how enamored I am with both Creepy John and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Nicodemus being my favorite. <laughs> but here we have a very nifty scene because it starts out very calamitous, as you might think, very contentious. Neither, neither person knows the other, neither person trusts the other. And we still have Nicodemus basically playing detective here, but the first half of their conversation is very unfruitful because they're wading through all the distrust on both parts. But then, then we have this thing that happens where Nicodemus lets his guard down and says, I'm dealing with something I don't understand here, a miracle I can't explain. And John's demeanor changes. He figures out, wait, no, nobody else knows you're here. Nobody sent you. That's when the real chemistry starts to happen. We, we learn that John is also, I believe, wanting to hear that Jesus's ministry has started. So this talk of miracles makes his ears stand up, so to speak. He is, he is interested. And Nicodemus is desperate. And so John gets a view into Nicodemus's soul where Nicodemus is sincerely searching for something that he does not possess. And that just endears me to him because I know that feeling. When all the world is giving you information, but you know deep in your heart that the world knows nothing, and you're looking for something real, yeah, that's when, that's the seek and you shall find that Jesus was talking about. 
Let's keep watching. So, I worked for hours last night, and I couldn't even catch one fish the entire night. And then Andrew and the boys showed up. Thank you for that, by the way. And none of us could catch one fish the entire night. It was horrible. And this morning, we finally gave up, and we went to shore. But there was this teacher on shore. And Andrew knew who he was, but I'll talk about that later. He told me to cast one more time, which made no sense, but I did it anyway because of the way he, he looked at me. And then so many fish showed up. They were pouring into the boat. So many kept coming that, that Zebedee ended up filling both of our boats, enough to pay off the whole debt. I... Eh... Uh, what? Why don't you seem happy? Well, this is hard to explain. More than what you just told me. No, it's like the story of Elijah and Elisha. Yes? Elisha was plying with 12 yoke of oxen when Elijah the prophet just walked up and threw his cloak over him. A right. calling to follow him. And without delay, Elisha slaughtered the oxen, burned the plow and left everything behind. Yes. The, the teacher. Andrew told me, but I didn't believe him at first. He's the Messiah. I know it sounds impossible, but I, I saw it with my own eyes. He made boatfuls of fish appear out of nowhere. And the words he spoke, the one John told Andrew was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was him. And then, and then he called me to follow him. And Andrew, James, and John to go where he goes and, and to learn from him. And he said that I wouldn't be a fisherman anymore, but that I would catch people instead. I don't even know what that means, but I'm sure what I saw. He's the one we've been waiting for all our lives, and I want to quit fishing and leave the sea behind to go. I know, I know, I know it makes no sense, and I knew it would make you upset. All I can tell you is that this I'm not is. Upset. Oh, why would I be upset? Come here. travel sometimes. I don't want you to feel abandoned. You have to go with him. How could I feel abandoned? I feel saved. Eden, yeah. yeah, it's not gonna be easy. When have we ever had anything easy? <laughs> it's not our people's way. <laughs> Are you going to help me? Well, I actually could watch you do that all day. Wash your feet. Uh, we leave for Canada today. What's in Canada? A wedding. What does a wedding have to do with the liberation of Israel? I'm about to find out. All right. This scene. Again, centered on wine and the making of... So we have, we have a wedding in the making. We know that Peter is about to go with Jesus and the disciples to Cana, Cana. But we don't know yet, by watching the this, this story, really what's going to happen there. As students of scripture, we all know what's going to happen, of course. But this is intriguing because we see Peter trying to explain the last episode, the, the filling of the boats with fish, to his wife. 
Peter got to do this quite a bit. Simon got to do this multiple times because he was married. We know he was married, but we what we don't know is how much time he got to go back home and give an explanation of his adventures, a recounting of his adventures to his wife, which would have been fascinating, wouldn't it? To have just been in on some of Simon's stories back to his family at home would have been wonderful. But we find that this, this is really a message to all the men because men, you need to lead your homes spiritually. You need to be the, the, the center spiritually in your home, connected to the one, not your wife. And for so many, the, the leader, the spiritual leader in the home is the wife, the, the, the mother. And that has been the case this whole time with Simon's home. We found that Eden was the one of faith. She, she's already made some very profound statements. I think in the last episode, she said, God is with me even if you were not. This is the coming of age, basically, of Simon, where he has decided to be a man of faith and to step out, stop being a fisherman and be a fisher of men and follow the Messiah. And you see the reaction of Eden, which is she's overjoyed because now she, she no longer has to be the spiritual leader in her home. This is why she is... She is relieved. She is overjoyed. She is now more secure than she was before. That is an interesting element to put in a show like this. So let's see what goes on next. I don't want to let him down. I don't want to do it wrong. Come on. We'll probably both do it wrong. It's like fishing. Remember when dad taught us? Dad didn't teach us anything. We just sat there. And watched. And then it was our turn and we made our own mistakes. <laughs> Can you believe this? Well, you guys are great. Hey. Hello. Have you been here long? Oh, yeah. Perfect day for a wedding, huh? Master. Simon, Andrew. Mary, James, John, Thaddeus. But where is, uh... Oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Raining figs. Figs? For the journey. Ah, now we won't even need to stop for lunch. Thank you, James. Yes, Master. Ah, two Jameses. How will we solve this dilemma? Well, what if, uh... I go by Big James? Is that acceptable to you, young James? Yes, I think that's fair, Master. And the sense of justice too, huh? If you're like me, now now every time you're reading through scripture, it's going to be Big James or Little James. And, and uh, I'm not sure if that's really good or not, but anyway, that's, that's what's going on. We see that these guys are worried that they are going to be disciples incorrectly. <laughs> which is which is pretty awesome. If, if you've ever just stopped and wondered what it might be like to follow somebody for the first time, especially somebody with with this reputation, this fame that Jesus has. Uh, that would be somewhat nerve-wracking, right? You, you would be afraid that you might do something wrong and he would send you home. So these are not unwarranted fears that we see from uh, Simon and Andrew, but certainly entertaining to watch. Never, never thought of some of these aspects before. Hmm. I think, I think it might be a little foamier on this perfect. side. Perfect. No? <laughs> I, yeah, no, it, it's perfect. And sturdy. Let me speak with the carpenter. I know their language. It will be okay. Will you help me decorate it? Dinah, please. Let me do this for you. Mary, I love you, but Rafi and I got what we paid for. I'm embarrassed how few timbers we could offer. And there's no reason to settle. Who's settling? It'll be perfect. There are many other things to do today, Mary. You said so yourself. 
Always the bright side. Someone has to be. <laughs> So the ladies here are looking at the hoopa, which is spelled C-H-U-P-P-A or C-H-U-P-P-A-H. Sometimes they leave off the C. It's not chupa, it's, it's hoopa. And it is a four-posted frame, usually decorated with lots and lots of flowers. They, they set these up at weddings. We even do that a lot of times in the West. I don't know that we call them hoopas, but I'm sure in Jewish families they do. But it represents a new household, very rudimentary, no walls, open, which in some instances, some people say that that just represents hospitality. There's no walls. All are welcome. But it also represents the new home being formed by the new newly wedded couple. And new homes, new New marriages start very primitively. There's not a lot of possessions yet. There's not a lot added yet. It's There's not a lifetime of stuff being accumulated yet. So that's what this kind of represents. And um, yeah, I found that interesting. It wasn't perfect for them. Perhaps it is also where the journey to many wealthy Jews. You believe important and powerful Hebrews will be there? Possibly. A very keen son. The most important and powerful person I know will be there. Yeah? My mother. Isn't your mother from Nazareth? Did you think much of your childhood friends? No, he didn't have any. That's not true. <laughs> I stand corrected. He had me. Compulsory service. I don't remember kids exactly lining up around the block. Mary, to... did you think that having brothers would be like this? I always wanted brothers as a little girl. Soon you'll have 12. Then tell me how you like it. 12? You'll see. Okay, this is really one of the funnier scenes because we just had this back and forth banter and it's all funny. But uh, Jesus makes mention of Mary having 12 brothers because he's going to call 12 disciples. I just wanted to mention that a rabbi with authority was the only rabbi that called disciples. I don't want to say regular, but your common rabbi, your Torah teachers in the towns, didn't have followers like disciples. They didn't call them. Only rabbis with authority called disciples. That's why we know that John the Baptist was a rabbi with authority. He called disciples. Shemai was a rabbi with authority. G Gamaliel was a rabbi with authority, of which we know Saul of Tarsus was a disciple. Elijah was a rabbi with authority. He had a disciple named Elisha, or Elisha, as Simon was calling him earlier in the episode. Multiple demons. I saw it myself. They jeered at me from inside her mouth. Nothing could be done for her short of a miracle. And she won't say who restored her. He did not reveal his name to her. <laughs> what? What? It has begun. What has? If he's healing in secret now, the public signs cannot be far off. Public signs? What? You know him? You can say that. What's his name? Who has ascended into heaven and come back down? I asked his name. Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Don't call Solomon to me, you wild mugger. Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Finish. No, you answer me first. Teacher of Israel, finish the oracle of Agur, son of Jekyll. Who has established all the ends of the earth? What, what is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. You are careless with Torah. God does not have a son except Israel. Israel is his only son. All of us. Suit yourself. You know, they'll put a man to death for blasphemy like that. Who will? You? It'd be a terrible precedent for Rome to adjudicate. I should never have come here. All your life you've been asleep. Make straight the way for the king. He is here to awaken the earth. But some will not want to awaken. They're in love with the dark. I wonder which one you'll be. No. If 
this man is anything like you believe or if he exists at all, you should leave this region. Your presence alone puts him in danger. If you think he needs my help, you've heard nothing. All oh, right, that every time those two get together is chills. Every flipping time, it's chills. John knows exactly who's doing the miracles. It's Nicodemus who is getting used to this idea that he has misunderstood Torah all of these years. Teacher of Israel, surely you know. That would have been very difficult to assimilate for Nicodemus. Being someone who, know, have you ever been here? You know what scripture says, and you know what it means, and then someone slaps you upside the head with a new possibility that, that puts your understanding completely at risk. It's not a good feeling, is it? It's, it's very unnerving when someone challenges your understanding of what scripture means, and yet... That's what Nicodemus is facing here. And my whole ministry personally has been to challenge people's understanding of what scripture really means. You see scripture itself, not our translations, our translations are not good, but the word of God is inerrant. It's just that our understanding is so flawed. And that is the very boat that Nicodemus finds himself in and he doesn't like it and i don't blame him i get it and also you've got this excitement from from john who knows that he knows what he's been waiting for but he didn't know either when the ministry would start he said if 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 he's doing miracles in private then it won't take long for the minute for the miracles to begin in public and remember the wedding at Cana was Jesus' first public miracle. And I know that you could classify some of the scenes from previous episodes as his first public miracle. And those were worked in to be private. Okay, And that's the difference for, for this series. Those were intended to be his still private miracles and and he's about to go on to public miracles miracles where he he does them with the intent of everyone seeing and so this is good this is exciting i th for me this is a lot of chills In a moment. Thomas! Okay, okay. Hi. Am I going mad? Or has 40 been the magic number all along? The head count? Why? Are we over? They always do this. I brought food enough for more. The last count was 80. You made a mistake. Maybe by a few. Even if I'm off by five, the wine. I didn't advocate for a fourth. But three is, is still enough for 60. Okay, we have Thomas with his Jewish I told you so there to Rama. Uh, we, we have the, the celebration happening in the wedding and you see Jesus participating in the dancing and the singing. And let me ask you, have you ever envisioned Jesus doing this? Because me being a American evangelical slash Pentecostal slash Christian, Never envisioned Jesus doing all these things. He was always the solemn Messiah on the scene with a purpose, and none of those things involved fun. All right, but I think that we've missed it because we don't understand the culture very well. That's what this show is bringing out to us: is that Jesus was a Jewish man in a Jewish culture where they did Jewish things and they celebrated Torah and they followed it, kept it, and these. These things were what they all did. 
and it's very cool to see. Ah, let's keep going. Oh, Thomas. You already see the doubting being written into his character, right? He is just full of doubt. He was full of doubt at the original scene where he's trying to figure out how much wine they're going to need for their party, and apparently they haven't planned for enough. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Amen. 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 Lighten your pores, like this. Three quarters full. If they ask you for more, tell them you'll be right back. But guess what? You won't be. Understand? And now, friends, the dance of Miriam. Thomas? Talk to me. Just watch out for the frogs this time. <laughs> oh, sons of Jonah! We were just looking for you. They're dancing to the song of Miriam, and we thought you wouldn't want to miss it. Of course. Let the three of us show them how it's done, huh? I don't think that's such a good idea. Why? Andrew has four left feet. Four? <laughs> Why four? When he tries to dance, he looks like a donkey walking on hot coals. <laughs> oh, Andrew, do you deny it? I've never seen a donkey walking on hot coals. Actually, that would be a terrible thing to behold. My son. Ah, Andrew, you see, even my own mother will join us in the Song of Miriam. They've run out of wine. But it's only the first day. Yes, and it's all gone. Not a drop left. Why are you telling me this? We can't let the celebration end like this. And Edger's family humiliated. Boys. Go we'll join the others. I'll be right there. Mm. Mother, my time has not yet come. If not now. Okay, the flashback to the time where Jesus was lost at the temple and his words to his mother were, if not now, when? What an awesome tie-in. What good writing that is. Just thinking about the chemistry between mother and son there. You have to wonder what made Jesus choose that moment other than the fact that his mom asked him, please, would you fix this situation? And I want you to realize that Jesus' first miracle was to create wine for a bunch of people that were already drunk so that they could stay drunk, stay happy. It's very unreligious, right? We're the religious ones. We're the ones that say that there, there is, I'm not saying you're supposed to be drunk. I'm saying that to party is important. The fellowship is important. The joy, the mirth, the happiness is important. And Jesus prolonged it. He thought it was important. So, hey, I don't know what your opinion is on all of that, but that seems to be the truth of it. So leave your, leave your opinion in the comments below. What do you think about that scene? This is what started it all. Okay, let's keep going.
Fill these jars with water. I'm not sure you heard her clearly, but we've run out of wine, not water. These are similar in size to your amphorae. The prudent marks, yes. He could have filled all the way to the brim. You're a very responsible person, aren't you? We are in a crisis, and I was led to understand you have a solution. Do you know why jars for purification rites are made of stone? <laughs> what? You heard me. Because the stone is pure. Less likely to stain or break, and it can't be made unclean. Yes. Fill these jars with water all the way to the brim. Why? You heard him. Start drawing water, quickly. Tell anyone you find to stop what they're doing and help. From the directions you have provided, I see no logical solution to the problem. It's going to be like that sometimes, Thomas. What did you say? I do not rebuke you. It is good to ask questions, to seek understanding. There's no time for this. I know of a man like you in Capernaum, always counting, always measuring. That's my job. And that people will think I have not done well tonight. Join me. And I will show you a new way to count and measure. A different way of seeing time. Go with you where? I, I don't understand. Keep watching. Okay, we just have to take a a quick interlude right there as well because we see more doubt from Thomas. We don't know if Thomas was really present at that time in Scripture, but he's beautifully portrayed in this particular story as being the guy in charge of the wine. And he has doubts, does he not? For good reason. And Jesus asks them to fill the water pots. And Jesus asks a very good question to Thomas. Why do they use stone pots for ritualistic cleansing, for, for the washing? And it's because you cannot make a stone pot unclean, according to Thomas. They're resistant to breakage. You only have to wash them off. So we know that because there are six pots there, that it's a picture of humanity. These pots represent, represent humans. And when God fills the pot, then what goes in, he changes. And what pours out of you is given to the master. And then the master, it says, doesn't even care where it comes from. All he knows is it's good. It's the best wine he's ever tasted, right? We know where that's going, but these six stone vessels represent humanity. And Jesus is the only one that can take a stone pot full of water and make what's on the inside valuable. It's very much like the Ark of the Covenant, which is gold on the outside, but what's on the inside is gold also. It's very much like when Peter is, Simon Peter is arguing with Jesus about the washing of the feet and, and Jesus, Jesus wants to wash his feet and Simon says, no, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet, then you can have no fellowship with me, no part of me. And Simon says, then just wash my whole body. And Jesus says, no. In this life, the only thing that gets dirty is the part that touches the dirt, which is just your feet. It's just our feet that get dirty because we have to walk through this life. 
but what's, what's the answer? Let me just wash the dirt off because the stone water pot isn't made unholy. It isn't made unclean. It just gets washed off. So there's so many interlinking stories here, teachings that are being portrayed wonderfully by this story. Let's keep going. You Surely see. there is more common, Dinah. Uh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Please do not worry. This will be taken care of immediately. Next round of wine right away. Thank you for reminding us it's all in the contract. Was your father a son mason as well? Smith. I think it broke his heart, but I apprenticed under a stone cutter when I was nine. Every man must leave his father. Masonry seems like harder work. <laughs> it isn't harder, it's just more uh, final. If the smith wants to change the horseshoe or the plowshare or the pot hook, he has only to put the iron back into the fire and reshape it to fit his designs. Therefore. Everyone, please step outside. Just for a moment, Thomas. Once you make that first cut into the stone, it can't be undone. It sets in motion a series of choices. What used to be a shapeless block of limestone or granite begins its long journey of transformation. And it will never be the same. Stop the music! Stop the music! Everyone, listen! I have something I would like to say. I would like to address the bridegroom and the bride families. At every wedding I've ever overseen, they serve the best wine first. And then, when the people have drunk freely, 
Much later in the feast, they serve the poured wine, the cheap stuff. <laughs> because by then, who is going to notice? <laughs> Am I right? But you, you have chosen now to serve the best wine I have ever tasted. Let us thank them for this unnecessary but honorable gesture. May the wedding of Asher, son of Rafi and Dinah, to Sarah, daughter of Abner and Hila, be as pure and as fruitful as this wine. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. To Asher and Sarah! To Asher and Sarah! So, those at that party were the only ones ever living on earth who drank wine as God himself makes it. Think about that. Is it Nathaniel that's describing being a stonemason and the, the finality of making a cut in stone because once you start that cut there is no erasing the cut like he says a blacksmith can make a mistake with the metal that he's working with but all he has to do is put it back in the fire and erase his mistake not so with a stonemason stonemason's cuts are permanent and again that's why i think jesus might have been a stonemason a tecton It's a beautiful story to tell when he's sitting there thinking about starting his ministry. Because once you do the public miracle, you've made a cut in the stone that can never be erased. You can't go back once you start. And maybe that is why he didn't feel like his time had come yet. But... His mother pointed him to that time, and his father approved it by the miracle. That is heavy as a 10-ton heavy thing. That is amazing. And Thomas, well, poor Thomas. He is another man like Matthew who tries to compute, make sense of everything. And Jesus tells him, just watch, and I will give you a new way to measure. Well, let's just see what happens to Thomas. Is something wrong? Yes. I was. a miracle. He gave us even more than we need. He invited me to join him. He wants us to meet him in Samaria in 12 days. Maybe 
Maybe for once in your life, don't think. Well, that was the end of episode five of The Chosen. How many of you, how many of you have ever just thought of Jesus as a person who likes to party? Who loves the fellowship to that extent? Who loves to be with his friends and his family? And then we have Thomas at the end who was messed up. He's wrecked and he doesn't know what to think. And Jesus asks him to follow him. And he says, meet me in Samaria in, three, in 12 days. No Jew wants to go to Samaria. But what is it that you have to get over in order to follow Jesus? There's always that, isn't there? There's always our Samaria that we have to, we have to face if we're going to follow him. I am, I don't know if that's my favorite episode or not. They're all my favorite now. That one's wonderful. I learned so much just from watching it. I, I'm just reminded of things like Samaria whenever I watch one of these. Ah, thanks for, thanks for watching that with me. If you want to watch more with me, subscribe. And uh, if, uh, if you enjoyed that one, give me a like. And uh, hey, if not, I just appreciate you spending a few minutes with me today. And we will do it again. So until next time, blessings. <laughs>